So, um, Henry James, 1843 to 1916. Um, now, I would like uh, some responses from all of you. Who is Henry James? Nantara, who is Henry James? Novelist. Okay, a novelist, okay. From, can you tell me a little bit more, anything that you know about Ashwin? Uh, what? He settled in England. Okay. From America to England. He moved from America to England. Okay. Um, beginning of realism. Okay. The word realism is associated with Henry James. Are you aware of any of his works? What are the great works that he has done? I'm just trying to warm all of you up. <laughs> The books that he has written, the novels that he has, are you familiar with any of his works? The Portrait of a Lady. Okay. Are you aware of any uh, trends in fiction writing during this particular period? Who are the other major writers of this period? We are talking about early 20th century, late 19th century. So, yeah, yeah, you are right that this is a period uh, normally associated with uh, uh, the growth of, you know, actually um, novel was doing extremely well during this period. And uh, when we talk about uh, novel, then it is basically realism that was the key feature, key trend. And who were the other writers? Who were Fitzgerald around that time. Fitzgerald was very much around that time. Yeah. Conrad. Joseph Conrad, yes. All right. So, um, Henry James was, yeah, I am just trying to give you a brief introduction to his life and his times. He was born in New York. So, he is a, a true blue New Yorker and a novel of the New York City. This is important. He was educated at Harvard Law, Law School and uh, um, spent, as you rightly pointed out, he um, shifted his nationality. He changed his nationality to uh, British citizenship. He lived mostly in Europe uh, for the better part of his life and uh, um, he had ardent sympathy for the First World War for the British people and therefore, he became a naturalized British citizen in 1915. Major works include uh, the portrait of a lady, very famous work, but then so is the Europeans and uh, the ambassadors. The golden ball is also one of the most uh, popular novels and so is Wings of Dove and there is a novella called Daisy Miller. So, if you look at his, uh, um, the titles of his novels, just pay attention to that. The Ambassadors, the American, the Europeans, the Bostonians. Okay, what do, what do uh, titles like these suggest? He is a novelist of the American, the Europeans, the Bostonian, the Ambassadors. Yes? Cultural difference, yes. Anything else? People centered. People centered? Okay. The setting. The setting is important. So, the Bostonians, the ambassadors, you know, the Americans who uh, act as ambassadors of America to European countries, the Europeans and the American. Not to confuse with uh, that George Clooney movie. Okay. So, and Daisy Miller, this is a, Daisy Miller is the title character here. It is a short novella which I, uh, which I will be doing as well in this course. So, uh, basically Henry uh, James is a writer or the novelist of terrain. So, setting is important. So, while discussing uh, Henry James, these are the features. Say, style is common to all writers. Whenever we talk about whether we talk about Fitzgerald or Hemingway, 
or someone much later like a Tom Wolfe and Jonathan Frenzer, we all, always talk about a style is always at the forefront. In Henry James, character is important. So, when we discuss his novels, we have to take into consideration the way characters influence, characters are foregrounded. Okay. Plot is important, but characters are much more important and so is the setting, so is the setting of his works. Uh, Henry James has also published, he was a very prolific writer, so a number of short stories and travelogues. Um, he has written a seminal essay, Art of Fiction and uh, this work on criticism, literary criticism, the art of the novel, which is one of the seminal, one of the foremost works of literary criticism. We have been talking about liter literary criticism for quite a while and I strongly suggest that all of you go through the art of the novel and his essay art of fiction. He wrote a memoir called A Small Boy and Others, Notes um, of a Son and Brother is his another memoir and The Middle Years which was, uh, uh, which was left unfinished and published posthumously. Uh, his uh, solitary play includes Guy Domville and he has, he was a prolific writer as well as a prolific letter writer. He has written over 10,000 letters okay, to his friends and his publishers and to his critics and uh, uh, several of these letters survive. A third have a third of this number has also been published. He also is the author of Nathaniel Hawthorne's biography called Hawthorne. So, coming back to who was Henry James and all of you know that he is uh, an eminent preeminent novelist, we have to understand that he is regarded as the greatest American novelist. Okay. Novel writing was never the same once he came into the picture. Along with Herman Melvin and Walt Whitman, he is credited with the flowering of New York. Okay, so, we, we are talking about the New York writers okay, and he is one of the foremost writers about New York and of New York. Okay. And he is also credited with the flowering of novel during this period along with Melville and Walt Whitman. Uh, what are, uh, um, uh, what is that particular movement which we generally associate Walt Whitman and Herman Melville? Who were they? Transcendentalists. Okay, are you aware of this word? Transcendentalism. Okay. And a transcendentalism, what was the terrain of this movement? New England. However, Henry James is the writer of New York. So, terrain is important. I am gradually trying to draw your attention to this fact that how setting is an integral part of uh, writers. Um, his major literary influences included Henrik Ibsen, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Ivan Turgenev who was a Russian novelist and he met him in Paris and he also met people like uh, Balzac, Dode and Emile Zola and also Flaubert, Gustav Flaubert, he is the author of Madame. Good, Madame Bavari. Uh, he was extremely influenced by George Eliot. And who are all these writers now? What is there a common thread, common link that novelists? Yes, but what kinds of novelists? All yeah, we associate realism with these writers. So Honore de Balzac, Emile Zola uh, is na uh, naturalist, of course. But then Flaubert, Turgenev, Henry Ibsen, these are the foremost realists. Okay. And George Eliot, he was influenced by George Eliot, especially uh, 
uh, in his depiction of portraying interiority, the idea that uh, the, uh, portraying the psychological turmoil of his characters. So, interiority and George Eliot and are you familiar with any of uh, George Eliot's works? Silas, Silas Manor and Mill on the Floss. Adam Bede, Adam Bede, yes. Okay. Anything else that comes to mind? Middle March. Okay. So Middle March is one of the uh, most enduring novels. Silas Manor, of course, but uh, Middle March is is uh, belong to that period when George Eliot's powers were at her peak. George Eliot, by the way, was a woman. Okay, so don't get misled by her name. What was her real name? Marian Evans. Um, the, we were talking about the uh, significant position of Henry James, and this should give you an idea that there have been numerous books on James. So you have uh, Richard Lyman Smith, the James Boys, a novel account of four desperate brothers, which is a book about which is a book about the James brothers, the four James brothers. Uh, David Lodge and also Com Toybin, they have also written biographies of Henry James and so has Emma Tennant and Michael Haynes. Edith Wharton was another eminent novelist who was extremely influenced by Henry James. He was almost like a mentor to Edith Wharton. The other day we were talking about Edith Wharton and her, which novel? The Age of Innocence. The Age of Innocence, which is also again a very uh, important work of New York. Yeah, so, she, she depicts the New York City with an eye of an anthropologist. So, this is the importance of the Age of Innocence. When novelists started writing like anthropologists. Yeah. So, uh, Edith Wharton wa and Henry James, he was uh, her guide, her friend, philosopher and also he mentored her in several uh, uh, literary ways. Now, to coming to Henry James's style, generally uh, yeah, he is a realist of course, but uh, his style is tentative and obscure. And we are often told that uh, uh, one has to chase clues throughout the work to understand what he is trying to. He is extremely obscure. He does not make things easy for us. He is no Charles Dickens in other words. Uh, he places great emphasis on portraying the psychological turmoils of his characters and most of his characters feel their way towards insights and understandings. Um, according to Henry James, uh, in life one cannot meet big truths, okay. it is the small events that matter, they make the larger picture. You do not come across grand truths, but you have to look at and you have to chase clues, the smaller clues to arrive at a larger picture. Interestingly, and uh, this is, uh, is perhaps uh, one of his most important contribution to literary criticism, the foregrounding of liter the literary character and not story. So, he says character is all, character is plot. Yeah. It is a character which uh, um, is the engine of a plot, character drives a story. So, it is the character which is important and not story. And if you, therefore, the, uh, at the beginning of this class, I had, uh, wanted to draw your attention to the titles of his works. So, now you understand the Europeans, the American, the Bostonians, the ambassador, Daisy Miller, so the portrait of a lady, right. So, character, focus is on, always on the character. This is what he says, character is action and um, his subjective school of fiction foreshadows the works of 
James Joyce and Marcel Proulx, who were those? James Joyce and Mod uh, Marcel Proulx were modernists, but how? I mean, uh, why do you think that his works? Stream of consciousness, yes. Um, so, therefore, Henry James's brand of subjectivism influenced stream of consciousness. Okay, and that re that reached its pinnacle in the works of uh, the likes of Virginia Woolf and Joyce and Proulx. Those were the modernists. So, again, we are talking about the interiority of characters. It all began with George Eliot and developed further with Henry James and reached the pinnacle with the modernists. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, James's setting and his terrain. Now, this is important. So, um, his characters are see he is very urbane. So, you would not find a pretty depictions of the pastoral and the idyllic and the rural in his work. So, he is a, no, uh, a novelist of the city. The city is important. So, you have New York, London, Paris and Rome. And uh, cities are almost like characters. They influence the way characters behave and feel. So, when we read uh, Daisy Miller or when we read uh, the portrait of a lady, we will feel, we will realize how important cities are. London is so important and Rome is so important. Paris is a character by itself. Again, we know what is a, a novel of manners. What is a novel of manners? And Henry James is a supreme novelist of manners and social conventions. Social class. Good. This the reflection on the society and how uh, etiquette. Good. So the the codes and conventions of a society and how they govern characters. Okay, so, people are, uh, uh, people do have their free will and people have their uh, unique agencies, but how these agencies get influenced by social conventions and codes. And uh, nowhere is this idea um, brought about more strongly than in Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence. Okay, that how our lives are governed and we are talking about the turn of the century society, the New York society and how these people were absolutely governed by courts and conventions and uh, uh, the manners. So, therefore, novel of manners. Any questions so far? Anything you would like to talk about or comment on? Srinidhi. One of the novelists who uh, was sort of with Gertrude Stein in Paris along with uh, Hemingway and the rest of them, but there are a bunch of writers who were in Paris around, around World War One time. Was he one of them? Not really. <laughs> okay. So, um, they belong to the subsequent generation. So, yeah. So, when we come to Hemingway, we will see he belong, he moved in the circle of uh, the likes of Gertrude Stein, as you rightly pointed out, Henry um, Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah, so they were a group. The kind, the uh, so therefore um, uh, we have been talking about Hemingway. Okay, so, and when we come down to Hemingway, we will be talking about this entire group of writers who were more like expatriates. Yeah, Americans in exile not exactly forced, but by choice in exile in Europe. So, Mr. Rajendra, um, does he, is he also part of the decadent movement because this uh, uh, society of man manners, which but is not exactly, but he, he offers a critique, he does not exactly endorse. Yeah, uh, the uh, uh, a typical aesthet or the writer of uh, writers associated with uh, the decadent movement, uh, also no, known as fin de siècle, end of the century. Remember, yeah. these are the, uh, the symbolists 
Okay. So, they actually extolled the idea of aestheticism and manners, but here he offers a critique, he remains very objective about the whole thing, yeah. that is the difference. Um, now, uh, this is an interesting comparison uh, with uh, people like Oscar Wilde and other aesthetes, because uh, Oscar Wilde too uh, portrayed the lives of um, very rich people okay. and so did Henry James. But then people like Henry James and Edith Wharton, they moved beyond what uh, people like Oscar Wilde were doing. They actually talked about the claustrophobia, uh, the claustrophobic and the stifling influence of this kind of society on people, Wilde did not. Okay. Wilde actually celebrated this kind of lifestyle, the decadence and they found beauty in excesses, right but not for people like James and Edith Wharton, who could look beyond, see beyond uh, the surface and they knew that how characters are and how people are actually stifled and suffocated because of the social excesses and mores and conventions. His life again you know, um, we know people like Jane Austen, who generally confined her uh, plot and her world view and her characters to a very narrow section of society. What is the uh, term used for her? <coughs> she lived in an ivory tower, right? An ivory tower writer and also um, she was a miniaturist, miniaturist of sort. Why? You are taking a very narrow section of society and then uh, you become an expert in representing or portraying, portraying that kind of society. So, did Henry James. So, he portrayed invariably the extremely rich, the aristocratic Americans okay, and their lives, but this is not the way Oscar Wilde would portray his rich people, his rich class or section of society. Okay, uh, he is interested in their relationships and thought processes and uh, his character, characters are invariably complicated and also self-destructive. So, rich people caught in their own social mores, in their own uh, set of life, in their sets, uh, in their customs and manners and conventions. They are eloquent, they talk a lot, they are lengthy dialogues in Henry James, they are perceptive, but still uh, at the same time they are also self destructive. One uh, expression that is commonly associated with Henry James's characters is innocent abroad. So, innocents abroad. Now, who are these innocents? Who are these innocents? The rich Americans, the extremely rich Americans and wh what is this abroad? Europe. Europe. Okay. So, just remember that it is uh, you know globalization for hen people like Henry James meant Europe. So, you travel to Europe and you have seen the world. So, um, his uh, Americans are innocent people, the proverbial innocent who is caught in the tangled web of the cunning European, the manipulative European. So, this is a common theme. Uh, most of them are uh, impulsive and reckless, they are millionaires uh, um, all the time. And, uh, um, they are aesthetes, this is very important, given to the life of luxury and beauty. Coming back to your uh, you know comment, so um, one key term uh, that is associated with uh, the aesthetic movement is 
um, art for art's sake. Okay. In Henry James, you would not find that. There is plenty of discussion of art, of beauty, but then you also know that beneath the surface, there is lot of turmoil, there is lot of the people are weak willed, okay. people suffer, okay. although they surround themselves with beautiful things. So, it is never like uh, beauty for its own sake, there has to be something more. So, there is a strong moral tone in Henry James. So, the uh, people and individuals and characters always have to take up moral responsibility for their actions in Henry James. So, this is the key attribute of his characters. Um, at this point, <coughs> let me read out this passage from, this is a short novel I had uh, Daisy Miller and uh, um, this is the point where the hero Lord Winterburn, he first sets his eyes on the young heroine Daisy Miller. Both of them are Americans and innocents abroad and they meet in Switzerland. This is how he describes, Winterburn describes. Winterburn presently risks an observation upon the beauty of the view. He was ceasing to be embarrassed, for he had begun to perceive that she was not in the least embarrassed uh, herself. There had not been the slightest alternation, sorry, alteration in her charming complexion. She was evidently neither offended nor fluttered. If she looked another way when he spoke to her and seemed not particularly to hear him, this was simply her habit, her manner. Yet, as he talked a little more and pointed out some of the objects of interest in the view with which she appeared quite um, unacquainted, she gradually gave him more of the benefit of her glance and then he saw that this glance was perfectly direct and unshrinking. It was not, however, what would have been called an immodest glance, for the young girl's eyes were singularly honest and fresh. So, what do you make out of this? What do you make of Daisy Miller? She is seen through the eyes of the hero, who is an American, a good American and uh, they are all visiting Europe and they would visit Europe for um, several months at a stretch. So, they are in uh, Switzerland and here he meets Daisy Miller, who is uh, visiting this country with her younger brother and an aunt and he meets her. So, what kind of a person does she appear to be in his eyes? Naive. Naive, okay. Ex what are the words? What are the key words? Fresh, yes. Fresh, direct, honest. Okay. So, her glance has and there is, she can look very directly at a man and we are talking about 19th century. Okay. Please understand that. Okay. So, 19th century uh, glance of a woman is very different, extremely different from the way you would describe a woman looking at a man today. Okay. So, what were the women, what were women supposed to be like in those days? Shy, shy and coy, okay, but was she? No, okay, but still that is still does not make her uh, immodest or brazen in his eyes. He knows that this is the way an American girl would be. Okay. She is very direct and that directness is a part of her innocence and her honesty, which he would not say about a European girl. The European women are never, I mean they are a complete opposite, a complete antithesis of uh, an American, a, uh, an average American girl. So, the idea of American versus European is a recurring idea in all Henry James's works. So, America represents innocence, uh, even naivet and young. It is a young country, people are innocent, they are naive. 
whereas Europe is old, decadent and well already you know crumbling under the pressure of its own civilization, under the pressure of its own grandeur. For Henry James, America and Americans lack complexity, which is good for him. Okay. A lacking complexity may be uh, a negative feature for many. Okay. It may be uh, too naive, too simplistic, may be not intellectually too, uh, um, too deep. Okay, but that is not the case in Henry James. They are innocent, therefore, they lack those kinds of complications and complexities which we find in Europeans. Okay. Uh, they, uh, the cultural distinction between the two continents is repeatedly brought out. The idea that America is a country uh, with uh, not a very serious past, okay. after all it is a young country, okay. whereas Europe yeah, is an old country, is sorry an old civilization, is an old continent and it is burdened with its past. Again the idea that Americans are less stifled by convention and therefore, more accepting of spontaneity. Therefore, people like Daisy Miller, they are spontaneous. So, when they say yes, yeah, when an American girl says yes, she actually means yes. When she says no, she means no, unlike a European woman, okay, who is more worldly. Whereas, an American girl is naive, simple and honest, that is the idea. Europe is artificial with suffocating manners and uh, again the notion of treasury, complexity coupled with uh, treasury, betrayal and intrigue. Okay, so, that is Europe for Henry James, okay. but those things uh, absolutely lack in Americans and that is his idea. So, he always he talks in terms of binaries. So, um, like we have seen in Daisy Miller, she is a young American woman traveling in Europe. She is charming yet reckless. Now, women are supposed to be charming, but not reckless. So, they have to be shy and coy, okay, but she is not. Um, it is a very short novella and we see her only through the hero Lord Winterburn's point of view. So, it is his gaze on her and how he reads her. Um, because she is direct and she is open and very honest with people, um, she is misunderstood. Her manners attract wrong kind of attention from various quarters okay, and then that is the basic plot of this story. So, again the major themes in Henry James are that uh, innocence of the new world that is America is always in conflict with the corruption of the old. So, the binaries innocence and the corrupt, the innocence and the corrupt Europeans, the innocent Americans, the corrupt Europeans. As I was telling you, there is also the concept of treasury, uh, treasury and betrayal and he talks about the Judas complex and who are the treasurers? The Europeans, they always let you down, they always stab you in the back. Um, as uh, you can always compare Henry James with Jane Austen who also wrote about a narrow section of society, but the uh, major difference between the two writers is that James is more experimental. Okay. He was remember a literary critic as well unlike uh, Jane Austen and also we are uh, when we talk about Henry James, we have to also understand his depiction of the psychological realities of his characters, the inner 
turmoils of the characters. So, the subconscious and which later gave way, paved way for the development of the stream of consciousness. Um, the portrait of a lady, which was published in 1909. Henry James describes the novel as conception of a certain young lady affronting her destiny. Now, not is he is not using the word confronting, affronting. What is affronting? Yes, Ashwin. Offended? Any other different meaning of a, what is an affront? An outrage. An outrage. Okay. So, she is not confronting, generally we would use the word confronting her destiny, but here she is actually affronting her destiny. So, she has sort of offended her destiny. And how can a certain young lady affront her destiny, offend her destiny? By? By? By not doing what she is supposed to do or perhaps by making uh, grave errors in her decisions, by making extremely wrong choices. So, that is uh, perhaps the, de perhaps her destiny laid out everything for her, okay. but she turned her back to at her destiny and made all the wrong moves, all the wrong choices. The major characters in this novel, uh, that is Our Lady, the portrait, whose portrait we see is Isabel Archer. Um, Ref Touchett, her cousin in England. So, Isabel Archer is an American. She is travelling abroad and she is in England. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Touchett, that is Ralph Touchett's parents. We have Lord Warburton, who is an English aristocrat. So, we have this lady and we have several suitors. So, Lord Warburton, Ralph Touchett, Casper Goodwood, he is Isabel's American admirer, and then Gilbert Osman, the European, he is the man who Isabel chooses over all these suitors. So, um, at uh, we have these uh, clear admirers, Ralph Touchett, who is her cousin, Caspar Goodwood and uh, Lord Warburton and she had a choice, but uh, who does she choose? The European, Gilbert Osman and what therefore, how she affronts her destiny. Now, um, from here, um, we uh, see I we have to start reading the novel, okay, because it is uh, practically impossible for me to read out the, you can look at the size of the novel and it is not, I am not capable of doing the entire novel in class. I would suggest that you look and you can make, mark the pages and chapters. Mm. My particular edition is Oxford University Press, but it is an old edition. I do not know whether you will get it now. I would suggest and please mark it down, what are the chapters that I want you to read. First is the preface. Prefaces are Henry James was a prolific writer, novelist, but he was also a prolific preface writer. So, he would give uh, prefaces to all his novels, but they are not glossaries. It is not like he is giving you a, uh, you know, a better understanding of his, uh, this particular, any particular novel, but he does not do that. Okay. What he does is talk in very general terms about the art of writing. Okay. So, he is not going to give you the key to anybody's heart here. Okay. He will talk about novel in general, the art of literary criticism and novel writing in general and you have to uh, pick these pieces and uh, all these jigsaw puzzles and put the pieces together. Okay. So, as I said in the beginning, he is very obscure 
even in his prefaces he is obscure. Okay. He will give you plenty of clues which he expects you to find answer to. So, preface is important and <coughs> from this I would suggest that uh, when we meet for our next class, you read at least uh, the first 100 or so pages. first 12 chapters. Chapter 1 to 12 along with the preface and this is only your first day's reading. Yeah, okay. um, so, as we were talking about the art of the novel which is a collection of these prefaces, where he talks about how a novel, what is a novel all about, but that still does not mean that he gives interpretations of his own novels. It is about the art and that is about it. Okay. Uh, so, Henry James and his art of the novel, he is credited with laying the foundations of modern criticism of the novel. Um, his principal contribution to criticism was to make writers and critics fully conscious of the narrative method, the point of view. So, this is important. Henry James is not, if not the most, but one of the most important contributions towards literature is the point of view. Now, Gayatri, tell me what is the point of view? So, the point of view is a perspective. Okay. Anyone else? What about you, Pragya? What is the point? You have done quite a bit of literature. Point of view is like, uh, saying the point of view of all the characters, like how they feel and like how, like how every action makes them, like every small instance makes them feel. Give me an example. Okay. So, point of view establishes who the narrator is. All right. That is one of the uh, features of a point of view, one of the uh, uses of the point of view. But what does what does the point of view do to us? Uh, I think the point of view narrative method gives both the interior monologue and the observations to circumstances of one person. So, we know the story completely through the eyes of one character involved. Could there be multiple points of view? Yes. yes. Can you give me example? Okay. My name is All right. Okay. So, these are multiple points of view. Now, uh, when you have the point of view and when you theorize the point of view, what happens? This is what Henry James did. He theorized the point of view. Before that, there was always this particular omniscient point of view, right? Think a um, Victorian novel, okay? And you have omniscient point of view. But in Henry James, we started seeing multiple points of view. That is his biggest contribution. He, he was one of the foremost writers, because he was also a literary critic, he could theorize about it, he could think about it, that there has to be, um, a, you know, a novelist started, starts giving his own perspective about the characters and the plot, but there has to be something more to it. Otherwise, it becomes a very, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you know, the, the entire idea of truth. Okay, uh, reliability. Okay, so now when we talk about the postmodern literature, especially talks about the concept of the unreliable narrator. Okay, so the entire concept of reliability is suspect when you have only one 
singular point of view. Remember Henry James is the one who gave us his short story the brilliant piece turn of the screw. Are you familiar with it? Turn, the turn of the screw please note it down. We will be talking about point of view in uh, using the turn of the screw as an example. So, for James uh, through this point of view, this is a device used to maintain control through the novelist generally use point of view to control uh, the third person narrative. So, through the third person narrative, the omniscient point of view, but um, he also renders the experience through the consciousness of the created character. So, this is where when you are talking about interior monologue. So, it is not just the third person point of view, generally it is the narrator's point of view and we are supposed to take it as the ultimate definitive truth, right. Okay. But when we start listening to other voices, especially the interior monologue of a character, what does that do? It is a modernist feature, yes, but what does that do? It, it gives us another point of view. Yeah. So, this is what the narrator thinks, this is what the character herself or himself thinks and this is how the other characters see this character. So, diverse points of view and the idea was to maintain, uh, to create a sort of flexibility rather than maintain one single unified control over the characters and their thought process, the idea was to give some kind of flexibility to the character, because this character is seen through different perspectives, the several points of view. Therefore, I said uh, one of the uh, uh, earliest examples of the unreliable character narrator is found in Henry James, The Turn of the Screw. So, it is important that we read. Okay. For this course, you have to read a lot, like it or not. If you, if you are the reading kind, then this is very good. If you are not the reading kind, then we are in trouble. Uh, so, uh, talking about modernism, I am sure most of you are familiar with the key features of modernism. Um, modernism is uh, preoccupied with the complexity of its form. So, we have this word the introverted novel. Modernism is also concerned with representation of inner consciousness and also concerned with the sense of the nihilistic disorder behind the apparent order and stability of life and reality. And one of the uh, most important significant contribution of modernism towards the novel especially was freeing the art from the shackles of the plot. inner consciousness. We are uh, gradually moving towards a stream of consciousness novel, the modernism and the, but of course, Henry James is not uh, the first American novelist. Who was one of, who was the first American novelist? Mark Twain. Yes? Mark Twain. Oh, Mark Twain, mm, but uh, even before Mark Twain things were happening. Well, you see the transcendentalist came later, you have you, are you aware of someone called James Fenimore Cooper, the last of the Mohicans, at least that should mean something to you. Okay. So, if you know the film, okay. so the last of the Mohicans and that is Cooper and uh, that is one of the foremost premier examples of American novel, otherwise we did not have the concept of uh, 
uh, American novel, we had English novels, we had European novels, we had people like uh, Miguel de Saventes who wrote Don Quixote. Yeah. So, we had a novel in a various parts of the world, but in America, Fenimore Cooper gave it a sustained form that novel the way novels are done. Okay. So, um, going to James and the introverted novel. So, he calls himself and this is important the chronicler of his characters lives. What does a chronicler do? He records. So, he observes, he is very objective about the lives of his characters. Okay. So, it is not going to be just a sentimental depiction, no emotional involvement with his characters. Rather, he just gives you a dispassionate record of his characters lives. And of course, as we have been talking about, his characters display enormous psychological depths. Um, he also is interested in this term called the genus phase world. What do you understand? This is a two phased world, yeah. And we were talking about the treacherous European, yeah, people who betray Judas complex. The world according to James is a, a paradoxical, duplicitous world which is doomed to end tragically. So, he has a nihilistic world view. Okay. There are no pretty endings for Henry James. I mean, you got to read his book called and many people think that that is his best novel. It is called The Wings of Dove, The Wings of Dove. And for Henry James, modern man is doomed to end tragically. Ten minutes? How much time do we have? Not ten. Okay. So um, while uh, talking about his characterization. So, Henry James remains interested, but as I was talk, uh, telling uh, you about, he remains dispassionate and detached from his characters. He employs the omniscient point of view and mostly he uh, perceives himself as a dispassionate onlooker. Okay, very objective onlooker at his characters. In his preface to the Golden Bowl, he says the impersonal authors, the impersonal author's deputy or delegate is present to give some near individual view of the business. Now, what is impersonality? I am sure you have done literary criticism, right? What is impersonality, concept of impersonality? Yeah, Shmita, who gave? Negative capability, you can distance. Yeah, the author writes about characters where there is no similarity to him. He does not have to draw from his own experiences to write. Okay. And also, that is one part and also, uh, the author remaining <coughs> detached yeah, with his characters, not to get emotionally involved with his characters lives. Yeah, see, uh, we have done brushed. All these people, they sort of anticipate brushed. Okay. Because uh, what did after all brushed tell us? The word, give me that word, theater of alienation, alienation. Yeah, so, to remain alienated to think from your, uh, 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 to feel from your mind and not from your heart, that is the idea. So, that is what Henry James told us in fiction. He continues in the preface that it is not that the muffled majesty of authorship does not here ostensibly reign, 
but I catch myself again shaking it off while I get down into the arena and rub shoulders with persons engaged in the struggle. Now, what does you, what do you un understand from this? The majesty of authorship. Exactly. Being suppressed yeah. He has to struggle hard. And that's what he suggests. That's what he uh, advises all authors. That you know, that an author has a desire, an uncontrollable desire to take charge, to control everything. Okay, but a good writer has to learn how to suppress those feelings to take control over his characters' lives. And sometimes he has to get down into the arena. Arena is like battlefield kind of place. And he is saying that he should get involved, right? While I get down into the arena and rub shoulders, put himself, himself into every character's shoes. I think he's saying yeah. uh, you can't help but get involved, but at the same time you have to hold yourself back. Yes, you have to remain detached without making moral comments and judgments about characters. You have to feel what every character is going through. So, there are no villains here. Every person, therefore, your heroine is also not confronting, but is affronting her destiny. It's like the interested but detached. Fine. Yes. Then, he is also interested in interior monologue. Um, as you know, this is a device where much of the action takes place inside the minds of the characters. And Henry James is again credited um, uh, of being the first novelist to use such intense examination of the psychological uh, workings, happenings of his characters, their, their feelings, their motivations, why they behave. So, it is not society that compels people to become what they are, it is also their own workings. Okay making them into what they become. Um, so, this is the, this is his legacy. He influenced people like Henry James, but, uh, sorry, uh, James Joyce, particularly in his Ulysses, which I am very sure. Have you done Ulysses? Yes. Yeah. So, there are extensive interior monologues and uh, stream of consciousness devices which indicates continuous flow of thoughts with no authorial intervention. Okay, so, the author sometimes he steps in, but many a time he steps back. Okay, the author cannot control the mind of the characters all the time. So, um, we will continue with this in our next class.